On today's show, Jason Quick is going to join us. We're going to talk about the latest with the Neil Olshay investigation. And the Blazers started the road trip with two losses in Los Angeles, as well as Phoenix. Welcome to Lockdown Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trailblazers, your daily Portland Trailblazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, world? It's your past first point guard and trail Blazers reporter, Mike Richmond. You're listening to another episode of Locked On Blazers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts. And today's episode is a very special one. We are joined by my friend and yours, none other than Jason Quick of The Athletic, a weekly guest, recurring guest in the show now. Jason, how you doing? I'm doing well, Michael. Yeah, you've uh, you've you're on the road. You're you're in between Phoenix and Houston right now, and I uh, appreciate you uh, joining us for a little bit. Um, it's it hasn't been a great road trip for the Blazers. It sounds like it hasn't been a great road trip for you either. Um, but you're still making time for Lockdown Blazers, so we appreciate you. Um, before we get into these these two losses, Blazers zero and six on the road. Before we get like too deep into sort of what's happening with them as a basketball team, sort of the big news this week is whatever's happening um, with the investigation into the toxic workplace environment, hostile workplace environment with Blazers president of basketball operations Neil Olshay. Do we know anything new other than that the investigation is ongoing, Jason? Um, nothing that is solid enough to make public. Um, sure. You know, there's a lot of, uh, we think it's this, we heard this, this is happening behind the scenes, but uh, I just, from a journalistic standpoint, can't make that public right now just because I don't have it on solid enough uh, terms. So um, I would say this, I don't think it's looking good for Neil. Um, And uh, you know, I think just anytime you have this type of action by a franchise, I can't remember when it's ever worked out well for the person involved. Yeah, I, I just, I can't imagine a scenario where he's back doing this job. Um, yeah. It's, it just, you know, regardless of what the investigation finds, right? Like if he's, I don't know what the right word would be, but like, if it's, if it's, inconclusive or whatever like i can't imagine that he comes back and does this job do you do you see a scenario in which he is the chief personnel decision maker for the trailblazers for the remainder of the year i don't i I really don't um again like like i said uh you know i just don't i can't recall any type of action like this by a franchise and having it end up um where a guy keeps his job and just from the nature of the stuff that I'm hearing behind the scenes that um, I, I think it's going to be, uh, I, let me put it this way. I'd be surprised if there wasn't action before the investigations even complete. Right. Like whether that means he resigns or, or what, or they fire him before they kind of figure it out. Is that, is that what you're suggesting? Yes. Okay. I just want to be clear. I don't, <laughs> Yeah. I don't, I'm not trying to pin you down to make a prediction, but I want um, I, yeah. I want to be be clear. Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, I've I've interacted with Neil enough to know that he has a short temper. I don't think like um, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, this isn't news to anybody. You yeah, know, it's it's yeah. not news to anybody. Yeah. So and you're telling I, me you've been yelled at by Neil Shea before, Jason? No, oh, geez, yeah. Um, but you know that that that's kind of the confusing thing here is that this has been going on for 10 years. So obviously there had to be some kind of incident that kind of brought it to this point because everyone in the organization and everyone who deals with the organization has just kind of gotten used to, well, that's Neil, you know? Right. And, And you either let it bother you or you just say that's Neil and move on. And I think a lot of us had just kind of accepted that's part of the deal in dealing with Neil and dealing with the Blazers is that he's going to be abrasive. He's going to be harsh. And uh, sometimes he's really going to piss you off. But uh, so, and the thing is, is that it's really surprising to me because Neil's really smart 
and he knows there are certain things you can't say and there's certain things you can't say to certain people and uh it would appear that he um had a momentary lapse of judgment and and overstepped those bounds yeah i mean it's like you just even without knowing the sort of the behind the scenes stuff or um having not been sort of privy to being a reporter who has these one-on-one moments with Neil Olshay, like if you follow the team closely, you've seen him, his, what he's acted like in public. And you can kind of surmise that, yeah, this dude's a little, um, this dude's fiery prickly and maybe has a times where he, um, he, he is more um, sort of abrasive than he needs to be. Like we saw it this summer in the press conferences where he, um, yeah. he would have been best served to dial it back and he was unable to dial it back. So yeah, yeah I, I think there's like an inciting incident here. And I imagine at some point we will get the details on what that inciting incident was. Cause like you said, um, it, <laughs> you only, you only have to do so much to get Neil fired up. He's, uh, he's yeah. it's, it's, it's easy to, to have it happen. Um, do we know sort of, do we have a timeline for what the Blazers want to do? I know they extended the the sort of investigation. Do we, do you have a sense of, of this coming to a resolution shortly or are we talking a couple weeks? Oh, I don't think it will last a couple weeks. No, I, I would think within a week it would be resolved. I thought scenario. it was going to be, I thought it was going to be resolved today when we were talking, Jason. Yeah, I, I did. It, Sure. Um, we're recording this and this is, this is going to come out on Friday, um, November 12th. So if it does happen, uh, Jason will have the goods for you on the athletic and, and, and perspective that, uh, only someone who's been covering the team as closely and as, as, as for as long as, as he has can provide, um, what will they do? Will they just go interim, interim GM? Will we see Billy Branch or Steve Rosenberry? Like, is that, is that your assumption? No, I, th- I think they would, um, bring somebody in. That would be my that would be my guess, yes. Yeah. Um, do you think this Neil stuff is impacting the team? Like, do you think it's th- no. it has an impact on the basketball team? I don't. No. I, I really don't either. Don't. I mean Yeah, I mean he he's not I mean he's obviously the most powerful and important person in the franchise. Um, you know, including Chris McGowan. I mean, he is, Neil has a lot of juice and he has every single decision that is made within this team from a basketball standpoint has Neil's fingerprints on it. Right. But when it gets to the season and uh, the day to day, he's not really in the picture that much. Sometimes he travels and, you know, right. he shows up at practices and stuff like that. But, uh, when it's time for the season and the, the actual basketball to be played, um, Neil kind of goes more in the shadows and uh, it becomes more Chauncey show. And so I don't think that it's really having that much of an effect on them because he never really had that much of an effect on them during the regular season anyways. Yeah, that's, that's my read too, is I've seen some fans say like, oh, there's these bad vibes with the Olshay stuff that's like, that's hanging over this team. And that's why they're have had some bad fourth quarters on the road. And that is just, that to me, that is just not what's happening. Um, that is the, the, those two things when particularly, and I think you point, you illustrate it well, there. like, once the season starts, Neil is, is, is a part of the team, but he's not operating in this. He's not like in the coaches meetings. He's not in the locker room. Um, in the, in my years around the team, I've probably seen Neil walk through the locker room four times ever. Um, yeah. And mostly it's like pregame to like joke with a young guy. Like he's not in there talking to Damon CJ at any point. Um, he's just not the day-to-day basketball stuff is not what he's doing. Um, he's making larger picture decisions. So yeah, I'm with you. I don't think it has any impact on, um, I think their struggles are unrelated um, to this specific Neil stuff. Yes, I would agree. Let's do you want to talk about basketball now? I, sure. <laughs> sure. I, I'm um, I'm ready for a resolution one way or another on this because I would love the basketball is interesting enough and the growth of the basketball team is interesting enough to not have to deal with sort of the sideshow. Um, I'm I'm sure you're ready for it too. So let's let's talk about basketball in the second segment. But first, I want to remind my listeners that this episode of Locked On Blazers is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's a place where friends and family can come together to reconnect. A place where class Classmates can meet up for a study group knowing they'll have dependable Wi-Fi and an endless supply of French fries and McFlurries. 
So win or lose, it's a place where teammates, competitors, the home team or the away team can come to recharge. It's a place you always look forward to stopping at on a long road trip to rest your legs and refuel. Uh, it's been a it's been a staple for me on road trips. It's a staple for me when I'm on the go in airports around the country. Uh, I'm sure Jason has had some opportunities on some early morning commercial flights to uh, to refuel at McDonald's. So why don't you do the same? Go to McDonald's, your local McDonald's right now to refuel and reconnect. Ba da ba ba ba. I'm loving it. Jason, you're lucky enough to hear me sing the yes, McDonald's theme song. You're also, luck, you're also lucky enough to hear me tell you about betonline.ag. It's the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. Um, they got a new and updated website, which is it's easy to use on your phone, easy to use on your desktop. And you can go there right now to bet on all of your basketball action. They got props and odds. Uh, and it, listen, any any game you want, you can get action on it. Not just basketball, but football, soccer, combat sports like MMA and boxing, all the way down to your favorite Vegas casino games. And if you go to betonline.ag right now, you can use the promo code Locked On. You get a fifty percent welcome bonus on your first deposit. So if you deposit a hundred bucks as a first time user betonline.ag it magically becomes $150 go ahead and take advantage of these offers betonline is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action that's betonline where the games start all right we talked to Neil Olshay in the first segment we're still chatting here with Jason Quick of The Athletic Jason what do you make of this basketball team on the road? O oh, and six, and um, t- two games to start this road trip in LA, and and, uh, and and then again last night in Phoenix, where they were in it in the final eight minutes, and then they were out of it in the final eight minutes. What what's going on from your perspective uh, with this team? Well, it's a lot, Mike. Um, it is indeed. Uh, I think it it starts with the defense. I, I yeah. still think they're having just too many defensive breakdowns and you know like Chauncey showed some frustration I think last night about he's having to point out the same breakdowns game after game after game and as I wrote this morning in the athletic it was probably as demonstrative as we've seen Chauncey on the court uh, during a timeout in the third quarter where he kind of pulled Nasir Little to the side and, and really kind of got into him. I don't, I don't want to say he was bitching him out, but he was like really um, animated in describing how he needed to help Cody Zeller. Um, And, you know, at the end of it, it was, it was really kind of cool how he punctuated. He slapped Nasir in the chest and was like, come on, man. And then Nasir said, yeah, all right. And then they both did a kind of a low five uh, really hard, like, that that to me was encouraging because as Nasir told me after that, that was me telling him, Hey, I'm cool. Coach me hard. I can right. take it. And for Chauncey, it was good because he's getting buy-in from these guys. He's asking a lot of them to play differently. And he's uh, being hard on them, pointing out their mistakes. And yet he still has that buy-in. He's still getting the effort, but there's, they just haven't ironed out everything. All that effort and buy-in isn't translating to execution on a consistent basis. And that's where we are right now. We're in this kind of ugly gray area where, <coughs> excuse me, where it's not smooth and, yeah. um, and games are being decided because of it. You know, this is, this team's talented enough to be making errors and, and still be, in the game against the Phoenix, against the, the Clippers, yeah. uh, against the Sixers, um, even though the Sixers were shorthanded. But uh, it's just these little things that are kind of uh, eroding, causing them to erode down the stretch. And then another thing, um, look, C.J. McCollum has to be better. Damian Lillard has to be better. Dame, that was probably Dame's best game last night, you know, 28 points, seven assists seven rebounds, only two turnovers, but you know, CJ McCollum's got to shoot better than one for seven. And yeah. uh, I think and in Dame November- probably has Dame probably has to shoot better than one for four from three. I thought that just yeah. like low volume, he can't be a low volume guy from three. It's what, it's what makes him so yeah. dangerous. So yeah, I'm yeah. with you though. Uh, it's, and you wrote about that too. The stars aren't shining and now we're, yep. it's kind of piling up on each other. Yeah. Uh, uh, to the Chauncey thing, we've seen him do that twice. I, I would say the um, 
uh, the Nas was more demonstrative for sure. But to pick a guy up coming back into the huddle, I think that's relatively rare in coaching. Um, like you, I would say just at this like, level. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Typically how it works in the NBA is you kind of uh, coach calls a timeout and then will walk out with his assistant coaches and kind of collect himself, talk about, make sure they get the mess, what they want to say, right. And have the guys go sit on the bench and kind of have their moment together. Um, And then the last minute and a half of the timeout, you come in and you say your piece because just you can't, uh, you know, you have to kind of pick your spots. Um, Right. So I think it's notable, and I'm glad you wrote about it, that it was like there was a moment where he was just like, no, before you get back there and think about it, I asked yeah. you to do something, um, and yeah. you got you, you got to get it right. Um, and, but also, I, I, I hope what people got out of my story, too, is that, you know, more than I can ever remember, there are these little pockets of discussions amongst the players mm-hmm. in the huddles walking out out after timeouts you know then pointing and saying well i think you should go around this way and what if i cross this way and there's a ton of those and dame even acknowledged that that yeah probably in his career it probably haven't had he probably hasn't been involved in as many discussions and he said that's because all this is new to us and we're trying to work through it the miscommunications uh just the the breakdowns and so I think that's really positive if you're a fan of this team because they're working at it. This is hard for them, and they're not giving up. They're (laughs) not giving up. They're not pointing fingers. They're not, um, you know, bailing on the coach like, oh, he doesn't know this. This system's not working. This, you know, screw this. Let's go back to our own thing. He there's complete buy-in, and I think these guys are really working and trying to figure this out and and they're working with each other. And Dame said, it's not negative in any way um, that they're just, you know, being very open. And and that doesn't mean that they're accepting mistakes. You know, he said, they're, they're trying to tell each other, Hey, this is your job. You got to be there. Um, But anyways, I think it wasn't just the Chauncey stopping Nasir and, and kind of, going at it with him it's been a collective and all throughout the games and i'm seeing it more and more i think in that phoenix game in particular it was two timeouts with norm where as you said you know the players go to the bench and sit down and kind of regroup well norm got up out of the bench and started addressing the, his teammates you know and kind of pointing and saying you got to do this we need to do that and you know pointing and crossing and all that and Larry Nance doing some of that as well so uh, I think that's a good sign for this team yeah I think some of it and I'm glad you mentioned both those guys because I think those two personalities veterans who've been on competitive basketball teams and and Larry Nance seems like a a take no shit kind of guy um he he seems like he uh if he has an opinion he'll say it but Norm like um both him I think like personality wise are like in a way that maybe other role players in the past would have deferred and said, you know, this is, this team is Damon CJ and we'll kind of go with their voices. Like I think Nance and, uh, and, and, and Norman both are, are willing to speak up and there's value in, in having those veteran voices with like, you know, if the, if the big word this year was, is accountability, um, it, it needs to come both internally and from the coaching staff. So I'm with you that it's, um, that it's a big deal. And I thought Chauncey had, and this is another, Listen, subscribe to the athletic, y'all. This is this is Jason Quick gold. You're not getting anywhere else. But um, and he wouldn't even call it gold. Jason would Jason would be insulted that I complimented his story. This um, <laughs> just a a gamer with such high praise. But Chauncey mentioned playing smarter above the shoulders, and I think that yeah. is absolutely the problem. Yeah, yeah, it's the details. You yep. know. Yep. It's not effort. It's not an effort thing. People want to point to defense as effort and energy. And I don't think it's that. I think it's, I think it's intelligence. Like, I think it's just like, Hey, this is what we want to do. If you, you know, the Nas thing is a perfect example. He was playing hard and trying to, you know, front uh, Frank Kaminsky in the post. And the the coach was upset because that is not the plan. Like you are, you are using your effort in the wrong way. So I I really think it's, um, there's some mental stuff that they, there are hurdles that they still need to overcome. I like too that last night Chauncey um, had his own moment of accountability. He said, "You know, we, we didn't think we needed to, uh, you know, basically trap double team front uh, Kamiski, and he proved us wrong. 
Yeah. And he had to own that, you know. And this is now, though, uh, quite a list of role players who are hurting the Blazers. <laughs> yes, <you know>? indeed. <clears throat> so um, that they got to figure that out. And, um, and I think that is an indication of just not being completely sharp on defense. Totally. Like if it's Harrison Barnes and George Niang and Frank Kaminsky and Kelly Oubre, um, I'm sure I'm missing some others in there. Like it's oh, Luke Kennard. Like it's um, – it's one thing to get burned by by Paul George and Devin Booker, right? And you say like, Dylan "Damn Windler. those, yeah." Those, you say, "Damn those dudes are good." Dylan Windler, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, eleven in the first half, three threes. That was that was trouble. Like it's one thing to get burned by the stars, though. Right. Um, it, you say, "Man, it's like it's a talent league." You know, at some point, just like talent will overcome your schemes. The scheme should be able to handle Kaminsky and Barnes and 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 all yep. and and the others. So yeah, I'm I'm with you. It's 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 an above the shoulders uh, situation for them. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about what's next for this team and like maybe maybe when it's appropriate to mash the panic button. Uh, but first, let's talk about Bill Bar. It's the best tasting protein bar on the market. Um, it's listen comes in a bunch of delicious flavors, but right now, if you go to built.com, you can get the coconut brownie chunk, uh, maybe the greatest built bar flavor of all time. So do not wait, go there now and get it. If that doesn't sound like it's good to you, there's a million other flavors that you'll be able to find in some limited time offers. So make sure you're checking built.com regularly throughout the winter, uh, winter season. Cause they're updating it all the time. All of these flavors, regardless of what you're into are packing a punch, 17 to 18 grams of protein, 130 to 180 calories four to five calories or four to five grams of sugar and no more than five, five grams of net calories. That's a pretty good deal. Or excuse me, net carbs, five grams of net carbs. That's, that's a little bit of fiber. It's, it's a little bit of protein. It's balancing you out. It's sugary sweet. It's wonderful. Go get yourself some at built.com. Use a promo code locked 15. That's locked 15 at built.com for 15% off your next order. Still a pass first point guard. Still Mike Richmond, and you're still listening to Locked On Blazers. Still chatting here with Jason Quick of The Athletic, my friend and yours, Jason. Friday night against the 1-10 and 10 Houston Rockets. Seems like a pretty b- a weirdly big game. Um, is This is a thing that you have... Um, you famously asked Chauncey Billups in a bad way early in the season. Yeah. How do how do you balance urgency and patience? I think yeah. there's reason to be patient, but there has to be a lot of urgency. This is not a game you can lose. Would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think just for their psyche, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they need to uh, they need to win that game. Yeah. Uh, even if it's, you know, they look ugly doing it, they, they need that win. And um, if not, then I think, boy, this could be a long season. Yeah. I, I hate putting that all in one game, but that, that should be an indication of, you know, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Things it, are rough. Yeah. It's like when you're digging deep, okay, we really need a win on a tough road trip. Like, Clippers, Suns, Denver, that's like, those are good. Those are good teams, right? Like um, you yeah. shouldn't be, uh, you want to win them because you fancy yourself a good team too. But like, you know, these are good teams on the road. They're challenging games. The Rockets are not that. They're one of the worst teams in the NBA, if not the worst team in the NBA, uh, with all due respect to, <laughs> to OKC um, and I guess the New Orleans Pelicans. But uh, like, do you do you get a sense of how... I mean, I, I know access is, is, is limited, but like how this team is tr- sort of striking that balance between urgency and patience, because it seems like the quotes are coming out that suggest patience, but there has to be, you know, they have to feel the pressure to some extent. Yes, but I, I think they have a pretty good perspective and at least listening to Dane talk about it. You know, he said, we knew that this, we would have some rough spots and, uh, that this is part of our buy-in that, Hey, we're not going to be dis- discouraged by some setbacks that we trust what Chauncey and the staff is doing. And we trust that it's going to be better if we stick to this. So, um, you know, but as competitors, they, they struggle with, you know, not having the, the taste of success. So that's where I think, um, where I think they, or why they need to uh, have some success against Houston. So 
you know, it, it, I think beyond just um, beyond the sort of patience and urgency type of balance, I I think we're seeing a couple new things. Blazers are playing a little bit small um, or smaller and bigger on the wings. What have you made of uh, the Larry Nance at center minutes that we've seen a little bit recently and just sort of Larry Nance's play over the last, you know, three, four games? Well, I think it's been really difficult for Chauncey so far to really kind of settle on a role for Larry. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it was one night he played nine minutes. And then I think last night he, he played uh, upwards in the 20s. He played 27 but, last night, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the Blazers made a really nice run there in the fourth with that small lineup mm -hmm. uh, with him at the center. And then – right when the the starters came back in that's when the lead kind of um uh, right ballooned back up but uh i i like it i think it's a nice change of pace i think in listening to chauncey talk about it he feels like it's only something he can do for small stretches and that's generally how most teams use their small lineups is right you know you, you can't be using them for nine minutes at a time or eight minutes at a time you know it's yeah, more like five, six minute stretches where you try to disrupt the rhythm and, and get the other team on it, on its heels a little bit. And I think that unit has done a pretty good job. I think the bench as a whole this year has been a real bright spot for Portland. Um, you know, Anthony last night was his shot was off. I think he was one for nine, maybe one for nine, Oh, for four from three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, they get a average night from him, you know, right. Three or four, uh, for nine, then they're right back in this thing. So uh, I've really liked that second unit. I'm I'm still a huge Nasir fan. I think even though he is uh, making some mistakes defensively, his effort is off the charts. I love the way he rebounds. Portland can finally execute a fast break when he's in the game. You know, <laughs> it's been I a mean, while since you could Portland, say that. Yeah, this has been the worst fast break team for like a decade oh yeah and yeah. now you know last night that was so pretty seeing Anthony dish off to Nasir and he finished it um <laughs> that's fun and this yeah. team needs some fun right now because I felt <clears throat> I felt in the first half last night in Phoenix they were really stale and uh, I thought they were doing a lot of ISO one-on-one -on -one play and I actually asked Chauncey about that after the game and he said uh that Phoenix kind of forced them to play that way because they um, were switching. So, yeah. Uh, so they had to, the guy with the ball had to kind of break his man down. Um, but still, I think CJ, Norm, Dame, they can all do a better job of getting that ball moving around a little bit better. Um, so I, I forget what the original question was. I think it was, oh, it's a small ball unit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but I think that's a plus. The on the Nas stuff, um, he, he, you know, I thought his minutes in the first half were like really positive on offense. And then yeah. it's like, Oh, what they're my, he, I looked at it, you know, in this, after his first shift is like minus four and this first shift, I'm yeah. like, and you know, me, a numbers nerd. I'm like, damn it, Nas. I'm like, come on. Uh, cause it felt positive. I I'm with you. Um, yeah. you shared an anecdote yeah. with me, um, that I would, um, that uh, the numbers lie, Jason. You shared an anecdote with me about uh, Nazir Little's uh, offensive rebounding. You want to oh, yeah. you, uh, you want to share that with our with our listeners, kind of what uh, Chauncey Billups said about what makes Nas a special offensive rebounder. Yeah, I thought this was really really cool. Um, so what they are trying to teach Nasir and and why they think that he's seeing some uh, productivity with his offensive rebounding is. You know, think about it. When a shot goes up, most of the guys on the court look up at the ball and start looking up at the rim and start boxing out. Well, at that time, they're teaching the seer to not look at the ball, not look at the rim, but look at the guys on the court and then navigate your way through them, kind of like a ski uh, slalom. Mm -hmm. And then you establish great rebounding position because you've navigated through them as they're looking up. And, you know, Nasir has great uh, leaping ability and he's got really yeah. long arms. So once he establishes that good position by kind of weaving through them, uh, he's got a really big advantage. But I've never really heard that concept or that tactic 
being taught. And I thought that was really cool. Um, so it's kind of a fun thing, maybe if you're at home to watch Nasir, how he navigates while a shot is in the air. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting way to take advantage of just like elite athleticism. Um, you you right. know, like say, say, for instance, like Ennis Cancer, he watched the ball, like an elite offensive rebounder, but you could watch his eyes. He would find the ball and he's just so damn strong that he would position right. himself where he thought the ball was going to go and grab it. And Nas, I mean, not he's like, he's not as strong as Ennis Cantor because no one is in the league, but, um, he, you know, this is, it's, it's kind of the exact opposite. He is finding those spaces and then utilizing that athleticism. I thought that was super fascinating. So I'm glad we, I, I kind yeah. of teased it earlier in the week i was like jason has a good story about this i'm not going to steal it from him <laughs> um, yeah. so uh, i'm glad you were here what do you make of um what do you make of tony snell because he's kind of getting into the rotation he seems like he's going to be the 10th guy almost every night what have you liked disliked thought of of tony's minutes so far yeah he's kind of he crept into some pretty crunch time minutes there i, I think he was part of that yep. fourth quarter uh unit that started the the quarter and made a little headway um I, I can't say that he jumps out, but it, it seems like he's really smart and he plays within himself, never tries to force anything. He's never going to take a bad shot. He's, he's going to take a shot if it's open, but he's never going to be a guy who you're like, Whoa, why'd you take that shot? You know? Right. <clears throat> and he seems really, uh, he seems like he's always reading the play right and is in the right position. And another thing, another side note, I'm, I'm sure people have picked, picked up on this, but uh, and, and this is kind of the sign of a, a longtime pro and why a guy like Tony sticks in the league so much. Anytime somebody falls, like last night, Larry Nance uh, fell over Jay Crowder into the first row uh, after he took a three-pointer. It was directly across from the Blazers bench. And Tony Snell raced across. He wasn't in the game at the time. Raced across the court to help him up. Same thing, uh, you know, like Anthony Simons gets hammered uh, going to the basket and it's kind of laying underneath uh, by the stanchion. Tony Snell will be the first one racing there to pick him up. And, you know, coaches love that. Teammates love that. That's just a sign of being really connected to the game and being really there for your teammates. And that goes a long way. And so watch it next time, you know, the Houston game, the Denver game, if a guy is down on the court and there's a stoppage of play, Tony Snell will get up off the bench and race there and, and pick up his, his teammates. So I think that's, it's just kind of a cool thing. Yeah. It's, I mean, it is, it is, uh, you're right. That's like, how do you stick in the league? You do the right, right. thing. Um, you, yep. and you, and you do the right thing instinctually. Yeah. I, I, I think Tony Snell's fine. I feel like he's has really slow feet, but, um, he seems to get his hands on the ball a lot. He liked some deflections and he's, and he's big. Like he's, he, yeah. he seems bigger than I, um, even he's though bigger I, than you like, think. Yeah, yeah, like it's like, oh, I, Tony Snell's like six nine and long, and then he starts playing. I'm like, oh, he's big. Like he's, yeah, he can, um, he can, he's, so, he can. Go ahead. So with the the big thing with Snell is like, okay, if you're gonna play him, at whose expense are you playing him? And I think right, right now it's it's probably Norm, you know. So yeah, that's or, or a, Cody Zeller a little bit because he's he's they're playing small in those minutes. Yeah, as opposed yeah. to so so Nance slides up. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. And I think that's where Chauncey has a little bit of a juggling act. And as he puts it, you know, putting the pieces to the puzzle. Uh, so it, I don't think he has a real good feel or sense for that. And I think it might be just a game by game matchup by matchup type deal. But, um, but I like when Tony Snell's in the game, I don't cringe or feel like something bad's going to happen. I think uh, he, he's a very, steadying and reliable uh facet of this team i think sure it, it's, it's just hard to play 10 guys in this in this league. it really it's is hard, it's hard to play 10 nine is nine is reasonable and you can get everyone their minutes 10 is hard and i think um you know it's, it's like it's not like snell is this like deserves deserves these these minutes over anyone else but it's it's like he's he brings he allows them to play small but not sacrifice too much size he's another shooter like he's just another element um so yeah, yeah i think i think the balance of like when to play him uh matters yeah. um and this is part of your, mm -hmm, get, go ahead getting back to your nance thing i mean that's something that i want to sit down and talk to chauncey about because it feels like it has been so erratic how he's playing him. And, and part of that too is I don't, I don't think Larry's playing as well as he would like, you know, no, he finally had his first good game against the yeah, Suns. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, 
uh, I'd really like to see his vision. And my, my sense is that Chauncey will be like, I haven't done a good enough job kind of carving out a role for him. Cause I think Larry's probably a little like, okay, what am I, what do I do? You know? Um, but that, that's something uh, that I plan on exploring here in the next couple of days. On a personal level, how much do you appreciate Chauncey Billups taking responsibility for stuff he screws up? It's really refreshing. Uh, I think everything about Chauncey from a reporter standpoint in covering this team has been remarkable. Um, he is a joy to cover. Uh, he's not overly friendly. I mean, he's not like trying to win you over or anything. He's just very real. Uh, and as you say, he, he's willing to own mistakes or perceived mistakes. You know, he's not afraid uh, to put himself out there and, and put the spotlight on himself. And he's very um, forward about, this is my first time doing yeah. this. And uh, I'm very new to this. But I do think he is coaching well. You, all you have to do is key on him during a game. Uh, and you can see the way he instructs and teaches and kind of like my scene with Nasir after the, or during the Phoenix game, like that is good coaching. You're very stern, but you're also encouraging. And they kind of fired Nasir up, you know, like yep. I wish people could see the, the low five that they did, you know, it kind of came from the hip and it was hard and they were both fired up, you know, after a pretty spirited talk about hey you screwed up right here i'm sick right. of saying this you know that's good coaching um so i i've been really impressed with him and and maybe i'm i'm skewed because he is such a joy to work with from a from a question and answer standpoint and just a a personality standpoint he's really pleasant to be around mm -hmm. so uh i i'm i've really enjoyed covering him yeah, I think like I'm I'm not around the team very much. Like my role is I come to the home games. Like I don't this is a, this is my full time gig. I'm not going to practices. I'm not on the road, um, right. and that's that's like not going to change. But I interact with Chauncey, and he answers my questions uh, ostensibly a stranger, very earnestly and honestly. And I ask him yeah. a lot of X's and O's basketball stuff, and he answers it. And he's like, um, whereas some coaches who'd be like who would say literally who the hell are you and why yeah. are you asking me about basketball strategy? Like he has yeah. from the moment, the first moment I walked in um, to the media room and asked him questions, he's, he, he has been very earnest and like straightforward and said, you know, I'm, I'm st the things I've liked the most is he says, you know, I'm, I guess I'm still learning that. And I'm like, yeah, I bet you are. <laughs> like, like, yeah, I bet you are. Cause I'm asking you after game seven of your, uh, you know, of yeah. your coaching tenure. So, I appreciate I think, him. I think he also gives, in the course of those, he gives uh, a great insight into how he sees the game of basketball. Yep. And I think I think it's a really sharp view. You know, obviously he's a very accomplished player, um, but I just like the way he sees the game and is able to communicate that vision. And uh, and I don't know, it, it's it's really been eye opening for me. It's been enjoyable. Yeah. I haven't loved all of his sort of like rotation stuff, but I think that's one of the hard yeah. parts about um, about learning the the NBA job on the fly. Um, but I've liked the offense, and I don't think it's Chauncey's fault that Damian Lowe is shooting bricks. Um, so yeah. like, and, and if and those CJ. shots right, and if those shots go in, if Damian CJ shoot better, um, then the offense looks a lot better. And that, like just numbers wise, the offense is still pretty good. And if those guys ever get rolling, you're gonna think like, oh yeah, hey. This dude kind of knows what he's doing on that end. And their defensive well, limitations are as much a product of who's on the court and who they have to play as, as it is right. the schemes. Um, yeah. I don't love it's, the zone, but yeah. whatever. Well, I think every coach does that out of out of timeouts or side outs, you know. Uh, yeah. But I, I, he hasn't he doesn't have the easiest roster. He doesn't have a conventional roster to manage. Right. You know, playing three guys that who are six three or under. Uh, is difficult, I think. So uh, you're already going to be doing kind of some unconventional type things. And I think he's still trying to get that feel for it. 
Yeah, I joked with you that if Terry Stotts had played a four guard lineup in back to back games, I would have thought that he was trolling Neil Olshay. <laughs> I would have thought <laughs> I would have thought that he was like he was like Neil, you want to see you want to see what you when you give me four of my best players under six five, you want to see what it looks like. But I think Chauncey was like literally just experimenting with, hey, these are our these are our four best offensive players. What happens if we play them together? We need to go yeah. score. So yeah. Uh, I think fr Friday's game is going to be fascinating because they really need a win. And it would be nice if they just beat the snot out of someone. Um, you know, they've yeah. done it. They just haven't done it on the road. Um, I'm, I'm, you'll have us covered. You're actually, I think, uh, just for the listeners' timeline's sake, about about to head to Houston. Uh, quick, yes. quick, about to about to fly out of here. So make sure you're subscribed to The Athletic because uh, he's going to give you the goods. And there's going to, like, this is going to be, this is a big game Friday. There's obviously some big news with the front office and there's no better place to get it then if you subscribe to The Athletic and support Jason's work, you, it's worth the price alone to read quick and you get a whole bunch of other stuff, just uh, literally hundreds of other writers for, um, for your money. So uh, go to The Athletic and subscribe now. Jason, appreciate you joining us as always. Thanks, man. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. <laughs> he's loving it uh, yes. tell your friends tell your friends about this podcast tell them they can find it um on wherever they get podcasts and also on youtube tell them that at the end of the episode jason quick sings if that's not a selling point i don't know what is <laughs> appreciate you listening i will talk to all of you very soon